North America and South America. Um, good evening um, to you folks over in Europe and a good night to anyone who might be joining us from India today. Um, and good late morning um, to you West Coast folks. Um, I'm Shane Wilson. Um, I'm a director here at Correlation One. And we're really excited to welcome all of you to the first edition of Correlation One's new webinar series, AI for Leaders. In this series, we will feature the trailblazers who are shaping the future of data science and AI and give our global C1 Connect and data science for all communities the chance to ask questions and learn directly from these luminaries. You can follow Correlation One on LinkedIn to stay up to date with all of our future AI for Leaders webinars. Before I introduce Stefan, I want to share a little context on us here at Correlation One and why we're particularly excited to be discussing, discussing machine learning for algorithmic trading today. For the past five years, Correlation One has been working with the world's most revered quantitative hedge funds and high frequency trading shops to optimize their hiring strategies for quant traders, quant researchers, data scientists, and data engineers. So far, this work has included testing over 150,000 candidates for the aforementioned roles via our technical assessments platform, C1 Assessments. Um, we have helped Citadel and Citadel Securities meet the world's leading quantitative minds via the Data Open Championship Series. And this month, we're working with Two Sigma and Point72 to connect them with more diverse candidates via our Data Science for All programming. If you are joining us for the first time today and are seeking to diver diversify, excuse me, if you are seeking to diversify uh, your strategy for quant talent, feel free to shoot me a note on LinkedIn and we can find a time to talk. Without further ado, what we all came for, um, I'm excited to uh, announce our first featured speaker, Stefan Jansen. Stefan is the founder and lead data scientist at Applied AI. He advises Fortune 500 companies, investment firms, and startups across industries on da data and AI strategy, building data science teams and developing machine learning solutions. Before his current venture, he was a partner and managing director at an international investment firm where he built predictive analytics and investment, re and in investment research practice. He was also a senior executive at a global FinTech company with operations in 15 markets. Earlier, he advised central banks in emerging markets, consulted for the World Bank, helped raise 35 million for the Gates Foundation to co-found the Alliance for Financial Inclusion and has worked in six languages across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Stefan holds a master's degree in computer science from Georgia Tech um, and a degree in economics from Harvard and Free University Berlin. Excuse me, I totally mangled that part. Master's, <laughs> master's in computer science from Georgia Tech um, and in economics at Harvard and Free University of Berlin and he is a CFA charter holder. Um, he's also been che teaching data science at Data Camp and General Assembly. And funny story, um, that's how I know Stefan. He was my data science teacher uh, back in the day at General Assembly. So uh, without further ado, we're really excited to have you. Welcome, Stefan. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me and welcome everybody around the world for this brief uh, webinar on machine learning for algorithmic trading. So let's dive right in and make good use of our time. So uh, what we're gonna do today in these 25, 30 minutes that we have, uh, I'm gonna just briefly talk about why machine learning for trading is hot today and why it's both interesting and challenging. Um, and then we're gonna talk about some of the main piece of this, uh, this chat, which is the second edition of a book that I published on the topic that just came out and I'm gonna walk you through the content uh, because there's a ton of basically readily available resources for you on the web if you want to dive deeper into the subject and especially focus on this end-to-end -end workflow that is the organizing principle for this book. Now we're gonna talk briefly about next steps. So what you can actually do if you want to try this out yourself and maybe trade a few dollars. And then of course we'll leave time for questions and hopefully some useful answers for you. Right, so why machine learning for trading, right? I mean, you probably know this already if you talk to Correlation One, who's obviously one of the key uh, players in, uh, in the field, especially when it comes to recruiting. But um, just to remind you, right, that uh, this has been going on for quite some time, uh, at least in certain segments of the financial industry. So there is a long history of various types of quantitative methods uh, for decades and decades. and. Uh, most famously, perhaps, uh, and successfully through Renaissance technology. A uh, recent book uh, came out about the founder, and um, they had an amazing track record by exclusively focusing on what today we would call 
machine learning since the late 80s. Uh, but they were like one of the few players that did that successfully. Most of the industry was using more classical statistics, maybe linear regression, and many other things. Uh, more recently, uh, DE Shaw, and especially the alumni from DE Shaw that started to Sigma, um, boosted uh, this area much further. And now, of course, it's one of the biggest games in town. And there are several reasons for that. And one is that some of the, uh, the strategies that funds used to run in the 2000s and after, they became more and more crowded, less and less profitable. And at the same time, you have this massive, massive explosion of what in investment is funnily called alternative data. If you do machine learning and other industries, then this is the normal data such as payments transactions of customers or mobile location data, maybe satellite imaging, and especially all sorts of information from the web, right? Like social media, Twitter, and so forth. And that, of course, has now also hit the financial industry. And uh, this alternative data industry has been growing like wildfire. And if you're interested, there's this alternative data.org uh, website that has a ton of uh, statistics, and it blows your mind how much spending and usage of these sources has increased. And that is a key driver uh, that makes machine learning much more useful and in demand in this industry because using these types of data sets very often requires machine learning techniques because they're less structured, they're larger, and uh, there's also more signal in them because in finance traditionally, uh, prediction is something that was considered impossible, right? You might remember there's this efficient market hypothesis that actually there can't be this dollar bill on the floor because somebody would have picked it up already and there should be no signal content whatsoever in historical data. But with new sources, uh, that has changed and um, people are also discovering that in conventional financial data, if you do it right, there may also be some signal especially if you operate in areas of the market that are a little, less, a little less liquid. So now many institutions are investing it, both in the resources to implement it technically, the data, and especially the talent. And I suspect some of you are here for that very reason. So a key takeaway as you approach um, machine learning for trading is that you need to take this end-to-end -end perspective uh, on it. Um, in a way, you always need to do this when you do data science, and with end-to-end, -end, I mean, you have to think about the ultimate use of your machine learning prediction, right? You have to actually think in finance or in trading, what kind of a strategy can I build around the ability to maybe predict returns for a minute or an hour or a day or a week or a month ahead? So you have to think around what kind of a strategy makes sense. And this is actually something that can be done profitably, given that trading costs money, given that you maybe not always, uh, that you're not always able to trade, given the markets you're in and so forth. So there's a lot of practical questions that you have to think through as you uh, embark on this endeavor of using machine learning to make trading decisions. And this is really what the book of this is about. And one of the good news is that as machine learning has become so much more popular for trading, there are also many more uh, open source tools available that allow you to do this sort of at home sourcing financial data uh, for free or at low cost and using all sorts of tools to extract uh, information from those data and build models and then backtest or simulate how a trading strategy would have worked. So and that's really what we talk about in the book. So uh, the, this book uh, that has unsurprisingly the same title at the session today uh, is the second edition, which is completely revised and updated from the first version, which came out uh, at the end of 2018. It has a lot of content. There's around uh, 800 pages, uh, four parts, 24 chapters that cover a lot of ground from uh, sort of the beginnings and the fundamentals to applications that are directly taken from the research frontier. And we'll dive into more detail in a few minutes. It's also very hands-on. And these are the resources I want to show you today because there's a GitHub repository that has over 150 notebooks uh, that lay out how you can apply machine learning in many different ways uh, to predict returns, of course, to allocate assets in a portfolio, and to do several other things. So let's take a look. Uh, you can find these things uh, on the web, uh, on the website mlfortrading.io, and there's also my GitHub link where you find similar content, but ready to code, actually. So all of this is freely available. So let's see that I can switch to my browser. 
there we go. So this is the website that lays out the content of the book. And I'm going to walk you through the outline and then highlight a few of the useful pieces that should be most interesting uh, for you to get started. So here's kind of the overall summary. And here is this end-to-end -end workflow, which ultimately is what should be sort of your guiding mental model as you approach machine learning. And this is what the book implements again and again in different contexts. So as you do machine learning for trading, you naturally start with, of course, some idea, some investment objective, some market you want to focus on. And then you think about which data you could source to um, extract signals that allow you to predict whatever you're going to need to make the strategy profitable. So the data sources is what has changed so dramatically over the years, as I, um, as I just outlined. And what's new is this alternative data bucket. So you need to find these sources and they need to be extremely pedantic about how you prepare these data sources because trading has this inherent time dimension. And it's very important that all these data sources accurately reflect uh, what was available and known historically. Many data sets have ex post corrections and you might be fooled into thinking that you already knew that the uh, revenues were maybe updated later when actually that only happened three months after the fact. So you have to be very careful in how you deal with uh, these data sources. And of course, you have to pre-process them, process them, especially the alternative data sources uh, can be very large in size, very unstructured and the like. So these are all these point in time adjustments. And then you have to dive into this entire uh, feature engineering piece. And this is where you in finance can build on decades of research that you shouldn't try to copy because that obviously will not be successful, but that you should build on so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So there's a ton of different indicators that have historically been tried and that may or may not be extremely successful, but that very often are useful starting points to, to build off. And we'll highlight a few examples uh, down the road. Uh, and there are very good libraries in Python that allow you to implement those uh, readily as a starting point. And if you have gone through these, uh, these steps uh, where you have some ideas about features you want to extract from your data sources, then the standard machine learning process starts. If you're familiar with machine learning in other contexts, this is sort of um, a copy paste approach from other areas. You have a different outcome, maybe it's your return, maybe you have different features, but this model uh, design, parameter tuning, cross validation aspect generally is similar to other areas, but you gotta be very careful about this overfitting because um, with overfitting because financial data is often limited. You have only a limited number of historical periods, so years in the past, and instruments, so assets that were traded. So it's very easy by running many experiments to get fooled into that something actually works when you've just found that one thing that happened to work in this, uh, in this context, which is more a random event rather than a systematic relationship. So you gotta be very methodolog methodologically careful about how you approach this. And then you move into the cycle of predictions that you obtain from a model that become the basis for, for a trading strategy. So now you need to take decisions. Am I going to go long the top 10 uh, best, uh, the top 10 predicted returns maybe over the next day? Am I going to short the counterparts for the next day? Or do I use a shorter time horizon or a longer time horizon? How do I manage risk? Um, how can I, how much, what, what kind of a differential in return do I need to absorb the trading costs? And then you're in the market. And then the cycle that you see from placing orders, executing orders, seeing how the portfolio evolves and monitoring its performance, that cycle runs as quickly as your investment horizon is. So that can be on a very high frequent basis, can be minutely, can be hourly, and of course it can be longer term. So this is essentially though the cycle that you then go through where you will be refining your model, its predictions and how you implement the strategy over time. So that at a high level is kind of how you would use in a fairly sort of standard way machine learning for trading. There are many other ways how you can embed machine learning in the process. So you can use machine learning, for instance, to optimize how you size the bets on specific uh, stocks, how you allocate stocks in your portfolio. New methods have, have been published there quite recently. And it's prominently also used to execute trades. So it depends on how you place orders in the market and how you execute them uh, se um, sequentially to minimize trading cost or price impact. So there are many other aspects along the cycle 
where machine learning can be quite useful. In the book, we're focusing mostly on the part of predicting asset prices um, and returns. So let's see what's in the book. At a high level, the four parts that I mentioned, they roughly follow this, um, this, um, this, uh, this workflow. And they start with the discussion of you know, the various data sources, how you can get them for free, or which, which providers are available to obtain them uh, for, um, against you know, some fee and how you work with this data, right? From scraping the web to obtaining tick data from the NASDAQ and processing it to getting uh, filings from the SEC exchange and then later using this for text analytics to extract sentiment and maybe predict earnings and prices. And there's a large chapter on how to go about financial feature engineering in the context of historical research in the field. And there's an entire appendix that outlines how to compute around 100 different indicators and then shows you how to evaluate their performance. Because just as important as being able to compute these uh, features, of course, is able to see this is actually contain any predictive signal. And they are great tools. There's a crowdsourced hedge fund um, in Boston called Quantopian that uh, has developed a Python-based platform so developers can experiment and develop um, algorithms. And they provide open source library such as Zipline that I'm using for backtesting in the book, as well as AlphaLens that you can use to evaluate whether individual indicators are contained signals, as well as Pyfolio, which is for portfolio level uh, performance analytics. So, so these tools are used uh, throughout these examples. And after you've looked at financial feature engineering, in the first part, we also will talk about portfolio optimization and risk management a little bit. And then we move on to really the meat of the book, which is all these different machine learning algorithms and how you can use them to predict um, returns typically over a given uh, time horizon, and then build a strategy on top of this and then backtest the strategy over some time horizon and see how it works uh, or would have worked uh, empirically. And so here you see some examples. Um, on the right, you see some outputs uh, that is based on a zip line backtest um, using, um, I think in this case, it's a, it's a, a gradient boosting model using, uh, I think, Japanese stocks. Um, and we can see how this would have performed uh, in an out of sample period throughout 2017 in the, in the top chart. We also see a rolling sharp ratio. And these different chapters that you see on the left, they lay out these different techniques. So the machine learning models give you a little bit of the background of the theory, how they work, but then demonstrate how you can apply them using different types of, of assets from US stocks to uh, international um, ETFs or international stocks uh, and others. So there's a broad range of, uh, of uh, models more than we have to uh, time to discuss at this point. But a key part is this uh, machine learning for trading workflow where we discuss in depth how we can use Zipline as well as back uh, trader to implement strategies of your own to load and source different data sets at different frequencies and use them then to evaluate whether your models and their related strategies actually would be uh, useful in, in an actual market. So that's kind of the, the fundamental piece of uh, the machine learning part. And if you go to the GitHub repository, uh, then there you find the corresponding uh, notebook. So for instance, you can look in the linear models uh, chapter of the GitHub repository. You can see how linear models are actually built, how you prepare model data using uh, the techniques that we discussed in the financial feature engineering chapter, and then how you can build a linear model um, on top of this data and evaluate whether the model predictions seem to be predictive. And then in the next chapter, you see how you build a strategy around those signals to go long and short uh, with certain trading cost assumptions, certain, certain market impact uh, cost assumptions, and then evaluate whether that actually would have produced a profit or a loss at the end of your sample period. So this is uh, the first part on fundamental methods in machine learning. Uh, then we have another part where we dive into natural language processing. And uh, this is one of the personally, I think, most promising areas, uh, not only in finance, but generally speaking, there have been huge advances over the, re over the last uh, several years. And uh, in finance is very often um, treated sort of under the label sentiment analysis. So to generally uh, identify if any text source such as financial reports or news and the like 
contain any value or like any information that suggests asset prices move in a certain direction. And there we discuss certain techniques to work with text and then implement these using financial news to actually predict whether uh, talk, uh, stock prices based on news move up or down. Uh, we also use more modern um, techniques such as word embeddings, which use um, uh, neural networks to extract features that um, because so with, with text, you have the challenge that you need to transfer to translate words into numbers, right? Because you want the machine learning algorithm to make, to do computation on them. So there are more advanced techniques of converting words into numbers that use these word embeddings, which in turn uh, are based on neural networks. And here we have an example where we take SEC filings and convert the text into these word vectors, which then in the next part, which is about deep learning, we use um, a recurrent neural network to predict whether uh, after the filing was published, the price actually goes up uh, or down and have actually some predictive success with that. So this is, uh, this is a, a smaller uh, part on natural language processing that takes you to the uh, research frontier in some areas on this field. And then finally, uh, we have the deep learning part, which covers uh, several applications from the fundamental uh, standard feedforward neural networks to the sort of more advanced convolutional and recurrent neural networks, as well as autoencoders and generative adversarial networks that you can use to generate synthetic data. And there's also a part on deep uh, reinforcement learning. And of course, this is the part that currently is attracting most attention. As you all know, deep learning uh, has you know, been uh, the, game, uh, the game to play. And some of the interesting applications in this area are, um, it's a recent paper uh, that has been published by, by AQR, the, the hedge fund, and Brian Kelly, uh, professor at Yale with two co-authors that uses autoencoders to extract risk factors from data uh, in a non-linear way and conditions these uh, risk factors on the stock characteristics. So rather than having risk factors that are predetermined such as exposure to some pharma French factors, they extract these, uh, these factors from data, so historical stock data, and then they also measure how certain assets are exposed to these X factor, um, to these risk factors using characteristics of these stocks. And this is also successful to predict how the stock behaves uh, down the road. And we show in, the, in, in the, the implementation of this paper that you can actually have some predictive success over, uh, say, daily um, uh, or weekly time horizon. So there's one uh, example that has, is I think going to be published in the Journal of Econometrics in the coming month that literally just came out a few months ago. Uh, there's also an example from uh, NeurIPS last year that uses generative adversarial network to produce synthetic time series. So you may have come across generative adversarial networks in the context of image data. So you might have seen these deep fake uh, videos or pictures of celebrities that look uh, very um, indistinguishable from real images, but are actually uh, sort of made up by a neural network. And more recently, this technique has been applied to different data sources, uh, originally in the medical domain to generate uh, patient data that allows to train machine learning uh, models to predict a certain diagnosis without having to interfere with the privacy and all the complications that you have around medical data. And of course, it's very interesting to see if this would apply in, um, in the financial world also, right? So you have different um, you have, you have data constraints often, right? As I mentioned earlier, there's only that many years of data and you cannot keep training a model on the same sequence of data because ultimately, as long as you, if, you, the tor if you torture the data sufficiently, it will confess and that's really not in your interest. So this, this uh, example shows that it's actually possible apparently uh, based on uh, several metrics to generate data that really is representative of the distribution of financial data and that you can use it to train a model and then predict uh, returns in an, on, on actual data. But this is a very promising development that you can also explore in this book and uh, see how this actually works in practice. So this is kind of an overview of the many applications. Um, obviously, we don't have a lot of time to dive into each of these in, um, in um, in detail, but I'd encourage you to take a look at the GitHub repo and explore the, uh, the Jupyter Notebooks where you actually can view all of those and you can download it and run it yourself 
and make this uh, your own. So you see there's a lot of detail and uh, detailed information on this, on this context. So let's go back to the presentation, right? So this is essentially uh, shows different ways how you can use uh, machine learning to use, to source different data, uh, uh, different market data, historical price data that you usually use to evaluate whether buying or selling uh, stocks or bonds or ETFs or whatever is your interest or cryptocurrencies uh, is something that would be profitable based on historical data. And you can integrate this with all sorts of other data that you think is uh, contains predictive signal to uh, further your, your mission. So how do you uh, approach this if you uh, want to actually dive into this? So obviously with the book, you have a fairly comprehensive source uh, or the Jupyter notebooks in the GitHub uh, repository. You have a very comprehensive source to, uh, to get started from how you get the data, process it, build your models, evaluate the models and build and evaluate trading strategies around this. You have very uh, lively communities that I can highly recommend. Uh, there's Quantopian, uh, there's also Quant Connect. They both let you build algorithms on their platform and they let you uh, evaluate the, uh, the algorithms and they may actually purchase or remunerate your algorithm if it's profitable and give you a share of profits that can be made with it. So this is a very good playground to sort of you know, test your skills and see if you're successful. They also offer competitions. And if you feel confident enough to risk your own money, then uh, you can connect to an actual broker. So, these, um, the, the libraries that we use for backtesting, like Zipline or Backtrader, they allow you to hook up to, for instance, the interactive brokers, API or other brokers, and then actually execute trades. So just as you sort of in, uh, in, in these dry run exercises, uh, execute trades to see whether in the past you would have made a profit, the same way you can run this, uh, this strategy and then trade it in a real market and execute orders in the actual marketplace. There, of course, you can lose actual money, but you can also win some. So uh, that's ultimately probably where, where you want to be. And there are more options now than in the past, and it's all fairly affordable in terms of trading costs. Uh, Taka is actually free. So, so there's kind of all these new tools that now are available that were not in the past. So a very thriving open source community that uh, makes it possible for you to become your own algorithmic trader and you know, learn something and make, maybe also make some money. So I think that leaves us at about 2.30, right? So maybe that gives some good room for questions of which I hope there will be many um, to make this a bit more interactive. Stefan, you're the most punctual speaker we've ever had here on, on uh, these C1 webinars. You're right on the nose at 2.30. Um, we have a couple questions that, that were pre-submitted that uh, uh, you know, we're going to kind of work through in addition to the questions that are currently coming up in the Q&A. Now is the time. If you've got something that you want to ask Stefan, put it in there and, and we will get to it as best we can um, within our time frame. Um, before I ask the first pre-submitted question, I myself am jumping to the front of the line here. Um, and curious, Stefan, why now writing a textbook? You know, you're, you've got your business going on, you're traveling around the world teaching, and consulting. Um, what inspired you to actually kind of say like, hey, I'm, I'm going to contribute uh, to academia itself? Um. So in terms of writing the book, uh, um, I generally enjoy uh, teaching uh, quite a bit. There's also uh, a lot of learning involved if you do this uh, yourself. But more than that, uh, in this field, there was no real domain specific uh, introduction uh, for trading and finance, right? So uh, there's plenty of books out there that, um, that treat machine learning, you know, as a standard sort of technique and they're all great and they're very useful. Uh, but then you are dealing with generic data sets and you miss this entire context of implementing models and transactions in actual markets. So um, this is something I was missing and I felt like it was quite, quite interesting because I had been doing this for a few years uh, in the context of our previous investment firm that I thought there's both demand and uh, value to be added. So here we go. Perfect. Well, um, to get to those pre-submitted questions, it's a super long book. Um, I appreciate you sending it my way, and I did my best to kind of read through it. Um, but it looks like a lot of our attendees today are interested to kind of get to the pragmatic stuff. What should I focus on? How can I implement this? Um, could you give some advice? Like, how would, how would you, uh, you know, advise someone to navigate the book? 
Yeah, it depends a bit where you uh, where you're coming from. Um, there, you do want to have some uh, um, background on finance. Uh, if you lack that, uh, then things like these chapters four or five are quite useful to just get a, get some context on what kind of features, you know, what kind of signals uh, have generally folks tried to extract from market and fundamental data so that at least you have something to start from uh, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. You may know this already, then this would just kind of repeat things. What you definitely need is, um, is this entire part about how you implement uh, the backtesting process and how do you evaluate the strategy and especially how do you incorporate machine learning uh, signals as, um, as, as a sort of an alpha factor into this process. Most of these engines are designed to directly take something like a, um, a, like a relative strength indicator or some momentum signal that you compute from data directly and then act on some rule. If the RSI is above X, then I sell and so forth. Whereas a uh, machine learning model has the strength that it takes many of these, of course, your own features and then translates that into an aggregate prediction that uses the sort of collective information that is in all this stuff. And then, uh, you know, based on that, you, you, you again, make your, uh, make your trades and, um, and then see what comes out of it. So this part is really crucial. You can take inspiration from some of the other strategies. You can learn about certain machine learning techniques that you are familiar with. You can see what's going on uh, in, in some of these, uh, you know, more researchy uh, papers that have come out. Or you can just sort of combine these and extract what you what you want to kind of uh, implement your own uh, strategy. Maybe maybe you're into cryptocurrencies. Maybe you're into specific time horizons. You know, then then you can just like take take some of these building blocks and apply them to your area and hopefully, um, you know, be successful with it. You know, I should have I should have asked that question to more authors when I was in college. How should I actually navigate this book? Super helpful, um, Roycey. What is our next uh, next question for Stefan? Yeah, I'll go off of the pre-submitted ones. And um, could you give us some examples of novel applications that use deep learning that you demonstrate in the book? Um, yeah, so it's always controversial uh, to use deep learning with um, with financial data uh, because supposedly, or as a as a matter of fact, there's only limited amount of signal in in this data, right? And deep learning thrives if you have this, you know, like images where the information is un unstructured, but there is a lot of signal in there. So uh, the interesting applications that sort of uh, go beyond this uh, um, are some I briefly highlighted. Um, uh, this autoencoder paper, I think, is quite, um, is quite promising. The authors achieve very good results. And in the application, I think we largely land in a similar, similar spot that, uh, you know, you can extract from data um, risk factors rather than relying on sort of those delivered by the academic uh, literature. And at the same time, figure out how an asset is sensitive to these risk factors. And there's predictive value in this. So you can use this to, to predict returns and uh, clearly uh, it's significantly better than a, than a random guess, which is usually sufficient. So, so that's one example. Personally, I think uh, the, um, the example I mentioned on the generative adversarial network front is maybe the most exciting one because uh, in, in finance, it is indeed uh, uh, a, a significant limitation that there's only that much training data to go around and this backtest overfitting fitting phenomenon that ultimately you think something works historically because you ran 10,000 experiments and found the one that actually did work in this context uh, is of course much easier to avoid if you have say 15, 15 or millions, million, uh, a million times the amount of data because you can generate it for free. Excellent. So uh, question, this is another pre-submitted one. So every, uh, everyone who's kind of putting them live in the Q&A, you guys are up next. Um, Lots of examples in the book. What are the main differences from the examples in the book? And what actually happens at a hedge fund? So time horizon is a difference. Uh, I do have an example in the book where um, Argo Seek, the data provider, um, uh, gave me five years of NASDAQ 100 minute data. So we do a sort of intraday uh, strategy as well. The data set right away goes to 10 gigabyte uh, if you only use two or three years. In an institutional context, of course, you operate at, you know, in real time uh, and rarely with end of day data as we often do in the book. So that's a limitation that is on the one hand, um, you know, due to the fact that people have limited uh, bandwidth or generally work on a laptop rather than an institutional uh, style cloud-based infrastructure. 
So time horizon and amount of data is one difference. And then access to general, generic, like truly interesting and novel data sets. Um, if you look at what I mentioned earlier, alternativedata.org, the, the amount of spending that large institutional funds are right now uh, putting into data sets is of course in the million and above range uh, that you know we cannot really ask a reader of a book to, to shell out. So of course we use free data, which means mostly market data, uh, some fundamentals and a few free public data, the available data set that reflect alternative data. But of course it's not a payments data set with like um, several hundred gigabyte or petabyte of data, you know, which is what you would be facing in an institutional context, but that doesn't change the process that you go through, right? It just changes the scale. So scale and velocity, uh, are among the key frequencies, the key differences that you, you would encounter um, in an institution. Um, I'll go with the next question. One of our attendees is um, asking, will Stefan ever use or has used the recommended models in his book in practical trading application by himself on actual orders? Yeah, so I work with clients. So uh, I wouldn't look at these models as a recommended model. Uh, somebody also said, why would you ever uh, write a book that says, hey, this I made it in algorithmic trading and here's how I did it and then create competition. That's not really the goal of the book. Um, there are several approaches that are quite valuable when applied to interesting data sets that are somewhat novel or limited in access. Uh, they don't necessarily differ that much. Um, so there are samples in the book from that they've used NASDAQ tick data um, that I actually used with, uh, with clients successfully using models of the nature that are available in the book, right? But we're not gonna trade with Quandle wiki data uh, end of day uh, and you know, try to implement this directly. However, the building blocks, they all, um, they carry over in variations, right? You gotta be creative. I just saw a cool one here. Um, unforeseen major events happen. It's 2020. It seems like there's a new one every month, um, <laughs> particularly with COVID-19. Um, how does this, how do kind of major macro force measure events like this uh, impact the predictive accuracy of ML? Um, well, massively, right? Um, I think so what you also see a lot in, um, in the industry, uh, finance and elsewhere, is that not everything is about automated trading, right? Where you need a machine that looks at the world and automatically knows what, um, what happens in a hands-off way. Around COVID, uh, I think there's plenty of information that if you had your eyes open and had enough capacity to process interesting information and looked at it the right way, that did allow you to anticipate at least the downturn, maybe not the upturn, but you could see them certainly see in which direction that was going um, if you process the data. That not necessarily is always related to predictive models. It may be sometimes just processing data and evaluating it, which you know uses not necessarily a gradient boosting or deep neural network, but uh, it certainly uses data and, um, and processes them use in a useful way. That's clearly once you have a regime change, right? And, the, the, the current reality is very different from anything you've seen in the past. You want to be very careful with relying on, uh, with relying on, a, on, on a model right, that has been trained on those past data. I'll go with the next question. Um, you have mentioned in your talk that you replicate some research recently published in top journals. So how do you keep um, how do you keep track of the latest research, and do you have a list of journals that you look up regularly? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, in in, in finance, it's um, I think financial applications are really only gaining steam in the last two um, or three years. There's a recent journal I think it's called Financial Data Science um, that's published by several financial institutions. Um, uh, that sort of collects some of the re actually relevant applications. So, so there are a few journals, um, you know, portfolio management, uh, even Journal of Econometrics these days is starting to, to show some, um, some machine learning applications. Uh, that, that, and, and then you have leading researchers in the field, right? You have obviously Marcos uh, Lopez de Prado, uh, recently Halperin and co-authors uh, produced another book. Uh, so, you know, these are circles to, to follow. They all have their specific areas, be that reinforcement learning, 
uh, or other areas that they focus on. So there are certain, I think on the one hand, you want to fo you follow certain certain people that are close to the academic as, as well as the applied sphere. Uh, Brian Kelly from Yale, uh, somebody uh, who I think has done uh, very um, interesting work and is a, at the same time an advisor at AQR. So that's certainly real life stuff uh, that you can learn from them, as well as look at, you know, some of the of the, of the, of the key journals uh, where, you know, usually you get quite a bit of delay in the publication. Excellent. I know we're coming up towards the end of our time here. So before I ask another question, Stefan, tell us, how do we get the book? How do we, where, where should we go? What's the pathway? Um, so I think, first of all, I really want to say that um, for me, the, the most important part is that you actually try out these things, uh, most of which is really freely available on GitHub and uh, check it out because as I said, uh, I, I do enjoy teaching and I think there's much valuable information uh, in there. So if you just go there, if you're interested, give it a shot uh, and I'm sure you find something useful. If on top of that, you think you want to dive deeper and actually read the book around it, then uh, you know, you of course find it on Amazon. Um, don't hesitate to add the links on the, on the website as well as on GitHub. But um, also don't hesitate to, to get in touch. Uh, if you find anything uh, on GitHub that you don't like, just raise, um, just raise an issue on GitHub or connect with me on LinkedIn. Don't hesitate to ask questions. If you have suggestions or have questions, I'm happy to engage at any time. Excellent. Well, I'm going to try and do the same as you did, keep exactly to our time frame here. Um, so we're just coming up on about 2.44 p.m. A um, couple next steps that we just want to highlight here before every before we, we outro. First and foremost, Stefan, thank you so much um, for, for sharing about your book, giving us some background on its inspiration, um, and answering our questions live. Um, for those of you who we were not able to uh, reach your questions today, we are sorry, um, but feel free uh, to join our next webinar. We will send over a way in which you can pre-submit your questions um, and have a better chance that we'll actually get have time to uh, answer those live. Um, in the meantime, follow Stefan on LinkedIn. Follow Correlation One on LinkedIn. Um, shoot myself, shoot Roycey notes. Um, if you have any questions about our future programming here at Correlation One. Um, the recording will be shared with everyone who is registered for this webinar. Uh, so keep an eye out. We'll send, over, send out that via email today. Um, and additionally, keep an eye out for kind of the next webinars that are coming down the line. Um, here at Correlation One, we're gearing up for a full fall of events, uh, largely around our Data Science for All programming, both our Data Science for All Women's Summit um, and our Data Science for All Empowerment program. Um, if you're interested, uh, we really encourage you to apply. All these programs are free to learners who qualify, um, and we're going to connect you with some of the most exciting hires in the world. Um, but with that, one more huge thank you to Stefan. Roycey, thank you for coordinating everybody and to all of you in attendance. Uh, we appreciate you spending your afternoon with us here. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank Bye you. Guys. Thanks, everybody. Have fun.